Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and a relatively quiet news day for Tesla, but we do have some other interesting things to go through, first on SpaceX, and then we also have earnings reports from BMW and Honda, so we can throw that into our Q2 comparison sheet for Tesla and other automakers. And as we have discussed quite a bit at this point, I'm pretty fascinated with BMW's approach for their flexible architecture strategy, the power of choice. Fascinated in, uh, I don't think it's a very good strategy sort of way. And they had some comments on that on the earnings call that we'll talk about as well. So first up, some news on SpaceX. Of course, earlier this week, they had the successful completion of the Crew Demo 2 mission with the splashdown of astronauts Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley. Yesterday, we had some more good news on SpaceX with the successful test flight, 150 meter hop, as they are known, which is just a launch and then a quick landing of Starship prototype vehicle SN5 or serial number 5. So this was a similar test to the Starhopper flight that happened last year, if you remember that. And the reason these tests are so exciting is because this is the iteration process for the vehicle that will eventually carry humans to Mars. At least, that is the goal. Elon, in June, said that they are targeting 2022 for the first cargo mission to Mars, and 2024 for the first crewed mission. Among other things, this test is for SpaceX's next-generation Raptor engine. This test flight was a single-engine vehicle. The final Starship is supposed to have six Raptor engines, and that will eventually sit on a rocket booster called Super Heavy, with 31 of the Raptor engines. As far as what comes next for Starship, Elon said, quote, We'll do several short hops to smooth out launch process, then go high altitude with body flaps, end quote. In reply to a tweet from rocket photographer Austin Bernard, which read, quote, Today marks the beginning of a new era, even though this is a small step. We are a giant leap closer to Mars than we were yesterday. The future of interplanetary travel is upon us. Mars, here we come, end quote. Elon replied, quote, Mars is looking real, end quote. Also in response to Viv on Twitter, he said progress is accelerating. So Elon was clearly very happy with the results of yesterday's test. And I think it's high time that I start covering SpaceX a little bit more closely. So please let me know what you think about that in the comments. But with all the progress that Starlink has had this year and with Starship now starting to come online, hopefully doing missions next year, there's a lot of exciting things to cover with SpaceX, even if we can't quite get as much insight into the actual business quite yet. All right, shifting over to automotive earnings, BMW today reporting their June end quarter results, Q2 for them. They reported deliveries to customers down 25% to just under half a million vehicles for the quarter. Revenues in the same ballpark down 22% to just under 20 billion euros, leading to a net loss for the quarter of 212 million euros and negative free cash flow of just under 300 million. So overall, all things considered relative to other automakers, not really all that bad of a quarter for BMW. We'll take a look at how that all stacked up here in a second, but first I wanted to point out one other number, and that is BMW's capital expenditures for the period. They spent about 1.5 billion euros on CapEx compared to 2.2 billion last year, so down 32% year over year. As I said a few months back, CapEx is something I've been watching closely because I think other automakers are going to look to cut back there to compensate for the financial hit from this coronavirus time period, which may end up delaying some of their electric vehicle initiatives. Of course, all these automakers so far are saying that that is the CapEx that they are prioritizing and that they're just magically finding all these other areas to cut CapEx spending, which, if accurate, could definitely end up being a good thing. Capital efficiency is very important, as we have heard Tesla talk a lot about now, but I remain skeptical, and especially so in the case of BMW when a lot of that capital expenditure is being used to create flexible architecture production lines, which we'll come back to in a minute. All right, so quickly circling back to June quarter results for the total automotive sector, Comparing Tesla against other automakers' results, the new additions here are of course BMW, then I've added Fiat Chrysler from last week, and Honda from this week as well. Toyota doesn't report until later next week. And then for Renault and PSA, I couldn't find their quarterly split, just their first half numbers in total, so not comparable, so I don't have them included here either. Zooming in on sales units, Fiat Chrysler definitely brought the average down, so the average is now down 40%. Generally these are wholesale, comparing to Tesla, which is deliveries, of down 5%. Then we have GM and BMW outperforming the other automakers, but again, maybe not a perfect picture because it really depends how much inventory they're then stuffing into the dealership channel. So while we are looking at the quarterly results, they are somewhat limited in terms of how much information they provide. Anyway, moving into revenue year over year for the June quarter, the average excluding Tesla was down 40%. BMW, Hyundai, and Daimler faring best here, aside from Tesla's down five performance, of course. Gap net income, Tesla and Hyundai were the only ones to post a profit, with the exception of Ford. As a reminder, they had a $3.5 billion one-time positive impact from Argo AI, so just for comparison's sake, I have excluded that here. Factoring in that exclusion, the average loss for other automakers, non-Tesla, was about $1.3 billion. And for other automakers reporting in non-US dollar currency, 
I've just converted that using the exchange rates from Google. Lastly is free cash flow, and just like net income, there can be a lot of factors causing this to swing from quarter to quarter, but on average, excluding Tesla, the other automakers reported a negative free cash flow of $3.5 billion, with just Tesla and Daimler managing free cash flow positive for the quarter. So hopefully that's helpful just to put Tesla's results in context of the other automakers. I think it shows how well Tesla's financials are developing, in addition to highlighting just how strong Tesla's demand has been, reporting a down five, which was production constrained, with the broader auto market being down 40%. Shifting the focus then specifically back to BMW, there were a few comments from the earnings call that I wanted to highlight. Topics that relate directly to Tesla or to BMW's power of choice strategy, which is their pursuit of both flexible architectures and vehicle design, which they hope will allow them to be adaptable to changing customer demands. As we have talked about for many future vehicles, BMW intends to offer four powertrains, gasoline, diesel, plug-in electric hybrid, and then all electric, and they call this strategy the power of choice. So Oliver Zipsa, CEO, opened the call, and one of his first comments was, quote, First, the most important trait of our global production network is flexibility. I can't emphasize this enough, end quote. Specifically, the context around that quote was BMW's ability to quickly stop and then restart production during the coronavirus situation, but it was clearly an overarching statement, and BMW doubled and tripled down on their flexibility strategy later in the call. UBS analyst Patrick Hummel asked them specifically about this later in the call, saying that right now the market is valuing the pure play electric vehicle strategy, Tesla, at $300 billion, and BMW's flexibility approach at $40 billion. So why does BMW feel that that is a superior strategy? And Zipsa had a pretty lengthy reply here, which I will read all of. He said, quote, So the question for the next decade is how do you conquer the growing EV market and at the same time do not lose the existing market? That's the task at hand. And we are not talking about 2050. Nobody of us knows how the automotive industry will exactly look like then. Our aim is to stay as profitable as possible and grow as much as possible during the next decade. Therefore, the approach to have a power of choice strategy, I think, is the only one which is going to work. Despite the fact how you achieve that, whether with flexible architectures or with dedicated architectures. And that is our approach. And I think the current market conditions support that. We have strong growth in the EV markets, plug-in hybrid and EVs. The mini electric is fully sold out fully sold out independent of range. So the range is, for us, a completely overrated topic. And for us, there is no, I think, no other way, end quote. All right, so obviously emphasis by me on that last part, but I did wanna pause here because I just found that statement to be kind of shocking. BMW estimates the EPA range for the Mini to be about 110 miles, and it starts at $30,000 in the United States, though it's not deliverable here yet, but they've only sold about 11,000 of those over the last year. Tesla is pretty close to that right now per week. That is a very, very small amount of data to come away with that sort of a conclusion on. 11,000 vehicles represents about 0.01% of the market. I really hope for BMW's sake that they don't actually believe that, but they have made similarly concerning comments in the past. Meanwhile, Elon of course commented on Tesla's second quarter call that he believes that the range expectation is rising to about 300 miles. Anyway, Zipsa rounded out that statement with probably a more accurate portrayal of BMW's decision-making process, I'll say it that way, by saying, quote, specifically, if you want to have a cost-based approach, we are convinced that if you are not able to include EV structures into your normal industrial structure, your cost base will go out of range, end quote. I don't know, I take that to read as BMW couldn't figure out a way to make a dedicated EV infrastructure model work, but their spreadsheets are telling them that maybe if they amortize enough of those costs over their current production line, then over time they can actually get to scale and provide an affordable enough electric vehicle. We'll see. I mean, to me this just feels like management saying figure out how to do this and not liking the answer that came back, telling the teams to figure it out anyway, and then giving their best case assumptions, then their managers giving their best case assumptions. This is just how things work when a company is operating in fear and not approaching things from a first principles perspective. In my former line of work, we saw stuff like this all the time. I think anybody that has worked in a large company can relate to this. It's essentially being a yes man or a yes woman, which sure does make things easier in the short run. Maybe you can pull that off for a year or a couple of years or maybe even several years, but that comes back and that hits you hard. And I believe from my outside perspective, that's probably what's happening here at BMW. So we'll see. It's going to be fascinating to see how it all plays out. But that will wrap it up for today. As always, thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and sign up for notifications. Also, make sure you're following me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast. 
and I'll see you tomorrow for the Thursday, August 6th episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.